Thank you. So um, I think one of the things um, that we have come to understand is that uh, Cuthbert Jukes was, was a great pathologist, and in the 1930s, he proposed that you should actually stage rectal cancer. And one of the central planks of his proposal for staging rectal cancer was the fact that lymph nodes predict outcomes. Uh, and his um, data was very supportive of that, in that patients who had lymph node positive disease had only a 7% chance of surviving for three years after surgery. Of course, we don't see those kind of survival figures these days. Uh, lymph node status does not really result in only a 7% uh, survival. But the idea that you should look at a prognostic factor and validate it by looking at the survival outcomes is an important one that we mustn't forget when we're thinking about other modalities, particularly imaging. Because what we see on imaging may not be the same as what the pathologists are seeing, and we need to validate what we see against outcomes in the same way. So I think as far as the modern application of TNM staging in colorectal cancer goes, there are undoubtedly big problems, and I think those problems are going to uh, affect the interpretation of clinical trials. So I will illustrate it with the sort of evidence base that we now have. The first piece of evidence is that simply saying that a T3 tumor is poor risk is blatantly untrue and will result in over-treatment of many, many patients because a T3 tumor can have the survival of 90%, the same as a Duke's A, or it can have the survival of a very poor prognostic tumor of only 25%. And the stage three classification of lymph node positive status is also heterogeneous. If you have four lymph nodes within the mesorectum and they're fully removed by the surgeon, it shouldn't surprise you that that patient neither ever gets local recurrence nor do they ever get metastatic disease. The current TNM staging system does not account for the distance of tumor to the surgical plane. It doesn't take into account the prevalence and importance of extramural vascular invasion and it doesn't take into account the specific issues that relate to the local stage of low rectal cancer. So my bone of contention today, and, and perhaps the, the audience and the, and the chairs can discuss this, is that T and N staging does not perform adequately in order for us to stage the patients either initially or after chemo radiotherapy. So that's the first piece of news. And I think it's illustrated very nicely with these three examples that you see here on the screen. This is supposed to be a relatively good prognosis tumor in whom you wouldn't necessarily want to give systemic therapy to, stage two, where there is um, T3D disease, so the tumor has spread out more than 15 millimeters, the tumor is extending to the mesorectal margin. That patient is not just a simple stage two, it is a very advanced tumor and we would stage it on MR as MR T3D. Doesn't matter about the lymph nodes, there is extensive vascular invasion which is extending beyond the mesorectal margins. So to do a primary operation on this patient would result in pelvic recurrence through two mechanisms, one mesorectal margin involvement, but also onward lateral spread from the veins which are extending into the pelvic sidewall compartment. The second patient is a stage three tumor supposedly, but in fact the primary tumor is only a millimeter through the rectal wall and one lymph node is involved. This patient would have, in our institution and in many UK institutions, would have primary TME surgery and would not receive adjuvant radiotherapy because their risk of local recurrence is less than 3%. So this patient we would not treat radically with preoperative chemoradiotherapy. And the problem is, is that many trials would include such patients in their cohort and since these patients are never going to benefit from preoperative chemoradiotherapy, it will result in a false negative trial because effectively you've populated a clinical trial with patients who are going to do well regardless of the intervention that you offered them. And this, I think, is the problem with the current TNM. The final patient is a stage one tumor where the intraluminal tumor is confined to the rectal wall and it looks like a, a, a T1 tumor. There are no lymph nodes involved, but the patient has a deposit within a vascular um, 
structure within the vein which extends to the mesorectal margin. So that patient has T1 disease, but has EMVI positive extramural discontinuous vascular invasion, which is involving the mesorectal margin. So this patient should be offered something preoperatively to cause sufficient regression away from the margin so that they can benefit from downstaging as well as a more radical surgical approach. So I think that, I think, summarizes wh where we are with, with this kind of problem. And I, and I think you shouldn't be surprised when you look at MR staging using the Duke system that it doesn't really perform, nor does the pathology assessment of the Duke sta staging system. It, it's not a good way of separating out prognosis. So what, where are we in terms of the evidence base for how we use MRI in the mandatory assessment of rectal cancer? Firstly, it is a way of identifying patients who are genuinely at risk of local recurrence. And unfortunately, nodal status is not the predictor for whether or not a patient will get pelvic recurrence. The main predictor for the, for the ongoing risk of local recurrence in the pelvis is tumor within one millimeter of the surgical circumferential resection margin. So preoperative staging by assessment of the relationship of tumor to the mesorectal fascia is crucial. We first described it in 1999. We showed prospectively, and it was the only prospective trial to address this, that tumor within one millimeter of the mesorectal fascia predicted for subsequent CRM involvement. And that we then validated that in a multi-center study with multiple different radiologists across Europe who showed that the one millimeter distance to the mesorectal fascia was the only real predictor for local recurrence, that two, three, four, or five millimeter distances made no difference in terms of risk of local recurrence. And we published the long-term uh, outcomes of these patients in terms of the five-year follow-up both uh, disease-free survival, local recurrence, and overall survival were predicted by MR assessment of the circumferential resection margin. And so, in other words, if you are to decide who's at risk of local recurrence, but don't take into account the CRM status, then you are re really not identifying the correct patients for a preoperative strategy. So um, what's also important is that there is some kind of team meeting with the surgeons, the radiologists, the oncologists to discuss all of these patients preoperatively because you just cannot tell who is going to have a problem with the mesorectal margin by clinical assessment or by endoluminal ultrasound assessment. So this is why it's very important that MRI um, is discussed before you embark upon a, tr a treatment strategy and that, that MRI should be of high quality, it should be a high resolution scan. And when you do so, you will start to find that there's a, there's a definite ability to predict those patients who are at risk of margin involvement. But in, in our practice, things have evolved. We, we don't want to predict margin involvement. What we want to do is that if the margin is involved, we want to predict what will be needed in order to get a clear margin. The first step, of course, is preoperative chemoradiotherapy aimed at downstaging the tumor away from the mesorectal fascia. But if that hasn't succeeded, then the idea is to extend the dissection so that the patient can still have a margin negative resection through means of an exenterative type procedure. And that is something that needs to be done and needs to be uh, proposed to the patient if tumor still exists at the mesorectal margin at the end of treatment. And, and in doing so, by looking at the different compartments within the pelvis, it is then possible to say who would require surgery beyond TME. And we have a, a pro forma to ensure that the correct compartments are identified so that they can be removed on block and the patient has a definitively curative procedure rather than a, a non-curative palliative resection. So, for example, in this case, you have tumor that's extending to the prostate. After treatment, there is fibrosis, which may or may not contain tumor extending to the uh, prostatic margin. Now, um, physically, it would not be possible to develop a TME plane of surgery because of the degree of fibrosis that has occurred. So this is the only sensible means of ensuring both a clear margin, but also that you don't inadvertently perforate the rectum or produce a poor specimen is to do an exenterative procedure. And that is going to be necessary in a proportion of patients. Probably between 10 to 15% of patients with advanced rectal cancer will need this kind of surgery at the end. Uh, but 
in terms of survival, if you do a primary procedure which results in a clear CRM, then those patients do extremely well and much better than if you try and salvage them for recurrent disease afterwards. So um, the idea between the, for the MRI is not just the staging, but also to provide an anatomical and surgical roadmap to enable the surgeon to decide whether or not they'll be able to do a TME plane type of surgery or whether they need to do something beyond it, but also to look at the feasibility of things like uh, transanal excision or, or other um, alternative procedures. So that, so that is why um, we do the MRI, but we also discuss the anatomic features of the pelvis and of the tumor in the preoperative MDT. And it's important to spend time on these patients. So in low rectal cancer, there was a problem with the TME dissection resulting in, in wasting of the specimen, tu tumor being exposed at the level of the puborectalis sling. And we identified a strategy which enabled us to, to find these patients preoperatively so that they could have a definitive operation rather than inadvertently perforating the tumor as, as used to happen in these patients. So what we talk about this red triangle of danger is if tumor is extending into that uh, triangle between the rectal wall and the distal levator and puborectalis sling, then these patients do not... Um, should not have a TME approach. They should have a beyond TME extra levator APE in order to make sure that the radial margin is, is not exposed to tumor. So there are two planes of surgery possible in low rectal cancer, and it depends on whether the tumor is confined to the rectal wall or not. If it is confined to the rectal wall, then you can do an intersphincteric APE, but if it is beyond the rectal wall at the level of the puborectalis sling, then an extra levator APE is needed. And we use this staging system in order to demonstrate which kind of operation is going to be needed. And wh what we found is that when we looked at this uh, and published on this, we found that you could substantially reduce the path CRM involvement if the, if the surgeon followed the recommended uh, routine. If they didn't, then we would find an increase in margin positivity rate. So in other words, if the MR said there are no adverse features, the TME plane is safe, the patient had a very low CRM positivity rate. But if, if um, either there was over-treatment or under-treatment, i.e. the wrong plane of surgery was done, then you would end up with a positive CRM. Other factors were found to be a, a risk also for um, positive CRM in low rectal cancers, and one of them was the presence of vascular invasion seen on the MRI. That was, that was associated with a threefold risk of margin involvement. So what we have come up with, really, is that rather than using nodal stage, rather than using T stage, that you should actually measure the depth of spread. Because when you measure that, you get a very accurate assessment of likely prognosis. It's been shown in all the pathology studies. And what is also very fortunate from the Mercury study experience is that the millimeter spread of tumor, as seen on MR, equates exactly to what the pathologist is likely to measure. So that means that we can stratify patients into good or poor based on the depth of spread rather than guesswork of nodal status. And it actually is prognostically more relevant. So what we would conclude from our findings of the Mercury study is that the assessment of the depth of spread gives the most accurate prognostic information and it is better than the basic TNM classification. And it's the least subjective and most reliable of all observations made by a radiologist. So that's something that we urge radiologists to report when they are um, assessing rectal cancer. So I, I'll move on now to the next item, which is looking at early rectal cancers, because MRI gives an opportunity to see these early stage tumors and identify them as suitable for a local excision approach. It's something that I think has been neglected because um, it's always been suggested that MR isn't very good for early rectal cancers, but actually it has a particular advantage in being able to ex give a very reliable assessment of how much muscularis propria is present, how much submucosa is preserved, and also the distance between the, sub the muscularis propria and the next plane. So for patients such as this, was going to have a TEM procedure, you could say with certainty how much muscularis is preserved and the fact that you don't have to remove the entire thickness of the muscularis in order to get a clear deep margin. And that's something that we are proposing and promoting in the minstrel trial in the UK, whereby we give a very precise assessment of the depth of tumor, the width of the tumor invasion, and how much uh, muscularis is preserved.
And in doing so, we can also identify some of these patients with early rectal cancer who have adverse features, such as a patient with vascular invasion, which may not be suspected on clinical examination and may be missed if, if a patient has a local excision but is not staged beforehand using MRI. So what we um, suggest is that MR should be done in patients with polyps that are more than five millimeters thick, because not only will it assess the depth and ex uh, of extension within the rectal wall, but it will also identify disease beyond the rectal wall and thus identify which patients are suitable for a local excision approach, as well as providing a baseline for ongoing surveillance if a patient does opt to have local excision only and, and a sphincter preservation. So, so this is the sort of simple kind of uh, algorithm we use that if the submucosal is free of tumor and there's more than a one millimeter submucosal plane, then that patient could have uh, less than a full thickness TEM in order to get radical clear dissection. Uh, but if the tumor has extended in a little bit into the muscularis, but there's still one millimeter free of muscularis, you could propose a local excision plane and then monitor the mesorectum for the possibility of distant um, disease within the mesorectum. So this is an opportunity, and I think we're going to test that in a trial, and hopefully that will prove to be helpful. So um, I think finally, um, what we would like to think about is, is EMVI. It's something that we see on MRI much more frequently than the pathologists see on their specimens. We see it in about 40% of patients. It gives a very characteristic um, appearance of tumor growing along uh, vessels, which are signal void. And when we see vascular invasion, it's associated with only a 30% three-year disease-free survival. Not only that, we see it twice as often as pathologists after treatment, after chemoradiotherapy. And when it persists after chemoradiotherapy, it is associated with a significantly worse disease sheet for survival. But for those patients who have regressed from EMVI positive to negative through preoperative chemoradiotherapy, these patients do as well as the patients who are EMVI negative to begin with. So it, it does mean that not only is it a prognostic indicator, but it's also a predictive indicator for good outcome. Uh, and therefore, it should be something that you can base, logically base your preoperative st treatment strategy upon. Um, and when we looked at the uh, importance of vascular invasion on post-treatment uh, uh, patients, we found it to be the um, single most important variable for the risk factor for disease-free survival. Uh, and in fact, nodes were no longer important either on pathology or on imaging, uh, and that vascular invasion seen either on pathology or on MRI were the only significant factors for the risk of distant failure, uh, which is the predominant failure in now days in patients with rectal cancer. So, so for this reason, we do really have to reevaluate why it is we're treating patients with lymph node disease when, in fact, probably vascular invasion accounts for the major patterns of relapse, which is distant metastatic disease. So, and not only does it um, manifest as distant metastatic disease, there are definite pathways of spread of these lateral veins into the pelvis, and, and we observe an association between vascular invasion and lateral deposits or lateral spread of, through vascular means into those compartments, and why chemoradiotherapy in these patients is going to be helpful. Uh, we find this three, almost threefold increased risk of pelvic sidewall nodes in these patients with vascular invasion. So, in other words, if we're going to stratify patients based on preoperative imaging, we need to do so on the basis of validated risk factors rather than questionable risk factors. Nodal stage is not now proven as a risk factor on MRI, at any rate, for the risk of local or distant failure. And if that is the case, then we shouldn't really be using that to base our treatment decisions. MRCRM is a risk factor for local recurrence. The T substage, rather than just T3 disease, is a risk factor. So T3 spread of more than five millimeters is a definite risk factor. EMVI is a risk factor for both local and distant failure. And afterwards, when we look at the tumor at the end, um, the reassessment of tumor and tumor regression grading, which I hope will be covered a little bit by um, Andre de Hall later, because I haven't got time, um, is also a good way of assessing uh, response. So um, hopefully, um, this has given you a little insight into how preoperative MRI staging can become mandatory. If I had another 15 minutes, I'd talk about post-treatment scanning, but I don't think I have that. So thank you very much.